In this video, we're going to talk about um, several misconceptions, probably this in the next video. Uh, we're going to talk about the three misconceptions about comparative advantage. Okay. Um, in economics, you can actually find some, uh, um, you know, very important concepts or ideas we introduced since uh, the introductory level courses um, all the way up to, you know, 300, 400 level ones. Um, you know, once you get exposed to that, once you learn that, you find it's very straightforward. However, um, among the general public, uh, you know, who probably don't have a, uh, uh, you know, a very good economic training or background, um, there's, a, a, you know, several um, things about comparative advantage. Uh, they were widely accepted or believed, but they are actually not consistent with the conclusions we draw uh, from theoretical models. And the import more importantly, they are not consistent with the empirical evidence. Okay? Now, uh, the first one here about the comparative advantage is free trade is beneficial only if your country is strong enough to stand up to foreign competition. Okay? Again, when you first look at this or hear about this, you may think, well, th this makes sense, right? This is reasonable. You've got to be strong enough to play this game. Otherwise, you're going to be the loser, right? And um, I guess my, you know, 11-year-old boy who plays tennis will know this, right? So um, if you want to, you know, attend or play the tournaments, you've got to be strong enough. Okay? Otherwise, you're going to lose all the games. Uh, however, in international trade, that is not the case, okay? If you give this myth the second thought, you would find that actually the logic behind this statement is absolute, absolute advantage, okay? So, um, you know, according to this statement, you got to have the absolute advantage, to be able to, you know, uh, to stand up to the foreign competition, right? You don't have to have the absolute advantage in everything, but you got to have absolute advantage in something, okay? However, recall what we already discussed with the PPF, CPF thing, or with the RDRS analysis. You find that, you know, in these numerical graphical examples, uh, we always give you you know, uh, like two economies where one of them doesn't have any absolute advantage, but they still gain from trade, okay? They did not become a loser in this trading relationship. They still gain, they still become better off, okay? So once again, gains from trade depend upon a comparative rather than absolute advantage, okay? We got to constantly remind ourselves about this because it's not that straightforward, okay? It's not, um, you know, uh, very much consistent with our common sense. The comparative advantage of an industry depends on its productivity relative to that of other industries in the same economy. So this is what we call the opportunity cost. This is actually, you know, um, why we find that recurring model is so important, okay? Uh, we find that, you know, uh, the, the, this is something we need to introduce as the very first model in our international economics course, okay? So when every economy gets involved in trade, no matter what they produce, no matter how much they can produce, no matter how productive they are, they should be able to find their own comparative advantage because they are comparing with themselves in different industries. Okay? Now, once they find their comparative advantage and produce relatively more in that industries, uh, industry or sector, they should be able to benefit from trade. Okay? 
Now here I would like to um, revisit the example I used at the beginning of this chapter. Okay? When we have two economy, two countries A and B producing uh, iPads and pencils, okay, where you find that uh, comparative advantage. I'm sorry, the um, country A uh, has no absolute advantage in both iPad and pencil industries due to its no productivity. Okay, so according to myth number one, that means country A is going to be the loser, right? It cannot get anything from uh, the trade with country B. But again, that's not the case. Okay? Uh, this is because it, uh, country A's productivity disadvantage is even greater in iPad than it is in pencils. So country A can still benefit from trade by focusing on pencil production. Okay? Uh, how could this happen? You probably always wonder, you know, if a country has um, no productivity, why it can still specialize and even export the pencils? This is because here we can add the monetary thing into our discussion, hopefully to, you know, make this easier for you to follow or understand. The monetary thing here is a wage, okay? Now, because country A has a lower productivity, so the workers over there will get a lower pay per hour. In other words, the low wage. If the wage is low enough, then country A would have a cost advantage in pencils. That's why or how it can produce and export pencils. Okay, so here when we talk about the cost advantage, okay, it's not just a labor productivity, it's also uh, about the wage, okay, uh, or uh, each dollar of labor cost, uh, how much it can uh, yield uh, in terms of the output, okay, like the pencils. Uh, this is actually the comparative advantage, okay. Uh, interestingly, you know, when we get here, uh, people probably, you know, don't have any problem understanding, you know, this, okay, the, and, and say, okay, so myth one uh, doesn't make sense now, okay, and, uh, but I have another question, according to what you just said, uh, you know, the wage in country A might be too low. Right? You said that you know the workers over there get a much lower pay to kind of uh, offset or, or um, kind of make up the lower productivity. Okay? Um, that's why you know their wages are just too low. Okay? And this led to um, another uh, myth here, number two. Foreign competition is unfair and hurt domestic producers due to their low wage, okay? This is uh, so-called the pauper labor argument, okay? It's pretty famous, especially among politicians. They use this every single time uh, when they are running uh, political campaigns, okay? When um, we have the, you know, elections. And uh, the pauper here uh, means poor. Okay, so the poor labor argument means, you know, the foreign labor is just too cheap, okay? The wages are too low in these countries, especially developing ones, okay? And there's no way for domestic producers to compete, okay? Once again, it sounds pretty reasonable, right? American workers get a much higher wage than Mexican uh, ones or Chinese ones or Indian ones. So how could, you know, these manufacturers uh, in... United States still, uh, you know, produce and uh, making profit out of this, right? Now, let's take a look at this uh, with the empirical evidence. The first one is, are wages really to know in foreign countries? Remember here, we cannot just simply compare wages. We have to add, you know, the productivity into our comparison, right? For a given productivity, 
are they get paid too low or too high? So let's check this out. Uh, here on the vertical axis, it's hourly wage as a percentage of the U.S. Horizontal axis is the productivity as a percentage of the U.S. In other words, we always use the U.S. as a benchmark for our comparison. Okay, and uh, when we move up along the vertical axis, you find that you know um, the pay gets higher, okay, more generous. Uh, when we move uh, right towards the uh, along the horizontal axis, um, labor becomes more productive. Okay. And what you see here, the 45 degree line just show us, you know, that's where the U.S. is on, okay? And um, here you can find um, these developing economies, Mexico, China, Philippines, they actually stay either very close or even on these 45 degree lines. In other words, their wages are very low. That is true. However, they're... Uh, productivity, labor productivity, is proportionally low, okay? Once again, it's proportionally low, okay? And um, so uh, you, you do find that, you know, some economies like Brazil, uh, Korea, and Japan here, they stay even higher uh, or above this 45-degree line. In other words, for their given labor productivity, they actually get a higher pay, okay? Uh, compared to uh, uh, American uh, workers, okay? Again, for the given labor productivity, okay? So from here, we know that, you know, these if economies, their wages are actually proportional to their labor productivity, okay? At least uh, this piece of evidence doesn't show us, you know, their wages um, uh, are, are too low, okay? Compared uh, to the U.S. Now, um, another thing uh, we would look like, we would like to take a look is, is there any way for domestic uh, producers to compete with, okay? Uh, putting aside, you know, the wages in the foreign country are too low or too high, okay? Now, um, once again, this was, you know, a, a topic has been debated over and over again. For example, before NAFTA was passed by the U.S. Congress and took effect in 1995, many um, were concerned that the trade deal would be a giant sucking sound as American manufacturers would relocate to Mexico due to its no, uh, lower wages. Okay? Uh, back then, the average wage in Mexico were uh, about one-eighth of those in the United States. Okay. However, you got to remember here that the what they worry about is just average wages. These wages are not adjusted for productivity, right? So, uh, I would like to raise, uh, leave these for you guys as um, kind of the uh, a quick assignment. Okay, um, you guys need to go and find did this actually happen? In other words, after NAFTA uh, took into effect in 1995, do we see, you know, this uh, giant sucking sound, you know, causing a lot of problems for American manufacturers? Okay. What evidence do we lead to test this argument? In other words, what data do you lead? Okay. And where we can go to find this data, okay, to test uh, this argument and bring your thoughts and data to class, okay. Uh, I would point you to, uh, you know, the Census Bureau and or the FRED. Okay? I believe you can find some data over there, um, you know, to test this. Okay? Uh, later in our class discussion, I will bring two more examples. Um, they are both related to this uh, uh, second myth. Okay? Uh, these examples are about the U.S.-Mexico trade uh, for tomatoes and the U.S. Chinese, uh, China trade for tires, okay? And again, we will uh, find more interesting um, discussions later, okay?